The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today we are, well, we're in Down Under. The whole country's down under, but we're at the bottom of, of the country, uh, the uh, uh, the south side. We're in South Australia, and I'm interviewing the wonderful Brenton Miguel from Goldsboro Financial Services. How are you, Brenton? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, I, thank you. And um, uh, I've got to admit to all of the listeners that sometimes when we do these recordings, um, uh, you feel a little bit like a duck uh, where, the, where the, the, the feet are sort of wagging incessantly and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pre-apologise for the 10 minutes it took for both of us to actually get on this this session, but um, it's worth the wait. It's definitely worth the wait. So, Brenton, when we were chatting off, uh, off camera, off air um, recently, and you mentioned a bit about yourself. You, you have two-thirds of your life you've been working at Goldsboro. So, I have. Yeah, which is actually, a, I mean, Sorry, the, the, I don't want to age you, but it's it's a reasonably lo- long time. I mean, you, you mentioned you got five kids, and and so maybe give me a bit of a feel. And I normally ask people, you know, give us a bit of a backstory of how you got to where you are. I would like to do two things. One is I'd like to find out how you got to Goldsboro, but be good to know why you stayed. It's twenty something years, so yeah, maybe give us a bit of a feel of what got you into financial planning. I, to be honest, Andrew, I, I fell into financial planning. Uh, I was a uh, a bank dude. Uh, I worked for the Commonwealth Bank in the 90s and did some time in regional South Australia. And part of that, uh, while I was down in the lovely city of Mount Gambia, uh, got to know a financial advisor who was coming down from Adelaide with uh, with the bank. And Keith kind of took me under his wing at that time and saw some attributes that I don't think I saw in myself. Um, and I eventually ended up back here in Adelaide uh, as a para planner for a period of time, uh, and then did some study, which in the late nineties the study was was pretty straightforward, to be perfectly honest, and and nothing like it is nowadays. Uh, and ended up as a financial advisor with the Commonwealth Bank for a couple of years um, before I, I guess, took a leap of faith and uh, came came over to Goldsboro Financial Services, uh, and that was that was an interesting journey in itself. Um, at the time, Goldsboro had three directors, uh, Glenn Todman, John Oliver, Peter Johnston, uh, and Glenn in particular took me under his wing and a couple of cups of coffee later and a couple of other conversations and next thing I've been at Goldsboro for the last 24 years. And for me, it's it's really about the culture that we've developed over that journey um, with uh, starting relatively small with about 12 of us on staff in, in early 2000s to the 22 that we have on staff now. So, Brendan, going back to Keith, who was your uh, the financial planner when you were, as you said, a bank dude. I'm not sure. Uh, um, you were probably the trendiest person in CBA if you're referring to yourself as the bank dude. Back when, <laughs> back when you get criticised from your kids for saying that. Um, what was it that 
I suppose, intrigued you when Keith would come into your branch. What, what was the spark? I think the spark for me was that I've always enjoyed working with people and I've always enjoyed problem solving. And so he, he offered a, a tangent that, you know, someone working as a teller or a back office person with a bank never got the opportunity to do so. And so from that perspective, it offered that opportunity to be able to, you know, sit and spend time with people, understand their situations, and then look to solve the problem as part of the process. And what, what were the kind of the problems? So in Mount Gambier, which for those people who are uh, a bit of a geography update, so how many hours south of Adelaide is that? Uh, about five. It's just reasonable, reasonable distance, right? Reasonable distance. Right. And, and it's a mi- mid-sized town, so it's sort of, um, you know, what were the kind of um, uh, day-to-day opportunities or problems that, that presented themselves in, in Mount Gambier for financial advice? I think predominantly for financial advice, it was a lot of, a lot of people looking to uh, buy homes so a lot of a lot of what I do, did was work uh, alongside the loans officers down there, but then looking at things like mortgage insurance and general life insurance. So in some respects, it was cutting the teeth, talking to people about insurance and the benefits of it. Um, but we also had lots of the farmers and a lot of rural folk that you know had, um, I guess that that um, tenure of owning property for an extended period of time, but then wanting to understand what they do. If they're looking at retirement, all of a sudden they, you know, do they sell? How do they hand over to the kids? Those sorts of issues. Some of that stuff I didn't directly get involved with, but it certainly offered the opportunity um, to be able to start to understand some of the nuances that that happen and happen with financial planning. And look, in the nineties, um, because corporate superannuation or sorry, compulsory superannuation effectively hit ninety two. People didn't have the big pools of super, so their their own dwelling uh, value of their property was quite important to it, correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and and in many respects, it still is. It's that's that's been one of the, the common themes, I guess, that you you talk to people about as you go on a journey with them as a financial advisor. It's talking about and understanding uh, what do they want to do with their home and how long do they want to be there for, and and everyone expects the value of the house to go up. And ad nauseum, when the reality is actually the opposite. There's long periods where home values do nothing, and all of a sudden we have a big jump and everyone gets excited. But if I go back, I guess, to the mid 90s when rates were still relatively high to what they are these days, helping people to understand their budgeting and some of the basics whilst protecting themselves with some of those insurance aspects was really important. So you've 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 done your diploma of financial advice. Uh, through uh, Deakin, I think. From I would have done it through Deakin, yeah. Through absolutely. Deakin. And uh, so at the time, I mean, you, you look back now and you malign the level of education, but that was about the highest watermark at the time yes. because yours absolutely. truly also did one of those as well. Yeah. And it was the first time that um, the, the DFP8 was the first time um, that they expected you to write a big full financial plan, which Correct. a lot of people listening today will, 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 is, is, is stock and trade, but it was quite revolutionary. Oh, look, no question at all. And so to do... To do the eight subjects for the, the Diploma of Financial Planning, I think I took a couple of years to do it. Um, and, you know, at the time, you're sort of trying to get your head around, you know, in some respects, what is this thing called superannuation and what are the tax rules and reasonable benefit limits? And then we start with income streams. And, and then all of a sudden, putting a financial plan together for, for an assignment that you go, hang on, I'm going to be doing that for clients going forward. And I think the rules and regulations around the the statements of advice back then were, in some respects, jam as much information as you could in there, and then we'll worry about what happens when you spend time talking to the client about it, rather than what I think these days is almost trying to have it as condensed as possible or as concise as possible, right? giving lots and lots of um, advice rather than lots and lots of information. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm reading off your own bio on, on the website, which is, my philosophy when meeting with you is to take as much time as necessary to work through any issues you may have, um, kind of at odds with a, a very prescriptive uh, financial plan sometimes. So oh, that's, that's that very much, that, yeah, that's that very much relationship one. So, so you've then, you've then jumped into the bit that I, I the link I'm missing is you obviously did your training at CBA, which a lot of people yep. listening um, went through bank systems, and you probably had a decent income there. And then, did what did you jump out and become 
because uh, you're you're an owner of, of Goldsburg now, but were you an employee in Goldsburg? Tell me, take me through that journey. Yes, yeah, so I came on. I came on effectively as an employee uh, for a period of time, and yes, I, I I took a pay cut to do that, but it was also looking at the long term of a better opportunity or a greater opportunity to be able to to build a client base and much more work with clients for the long term. And in fact, I've got some clients still today uh, who have been clients with me for the 24 years I've been here at Goldsboro. So it's it's part of taking people on a journey. And when I joined Goldsboro as a, a 30-year-old, uh, there were still some older advisors, not just at Goldsboro, but in the industry going, nah, a young kid in inverted commas, it's going to take him years and years to to get anywhere. Um, I guess for me, it was just about you know, lots of hard work and and lots of hours and making sure that you just you take the time, but you build the relationship with the clients. And um, you, I, I, we also were having a quick chat earlier. You you actually got quite a few kids, right? So so you, as far as time management um, and spending time with your clients, it must be quite a juggle. Um, uh, how do you how do you spend your spare time other than being an Uber for your children? <laughs> so my I've got I've got three kids from my first marriage, and uh, my oldest is now nursing. Uh, I've got a son living in Hobart who's a radiotherapist, and I've got a son in Melbourne who's studying engineering, and then my younger two. So I spent lots of time uh, as a single dad for a while there, uh, and that was you know that was the juggling thing that you did. Uh, I've got Clara and Harriet who are 10 and 8, uh, that yes, it's very much becoming mum and dad driving the girls to and from various sporting events. Um, for myself, I still play field hockey uh, and I'm very actively involved in the Forestville Hockey Club uh, where we all play. Um, so weekends for us from sort of early April until the end of September, we kind of say to our friends in late April, We'll see in September because our weekends are generally full of hockey. Um, but otherwise, uh, I guess for me, just spending time with friends and family uh, is is a way to go. And it would be absolutely remiss of me uh, to not take this opportunity, given that we're called Ensemble and this yes. podcast is coming out as part of an Ensemble. You are in the brass band, correct? I am. I am. I've been involved with Mitcham City Brass for a long time. Um, and so for me... Music, music, something that I've always loved and enjoyed, uh, and it's it's just generally it's a it's a great stress relief. That's for sure. Um, the other thing that I've got at home, uh, I've got a model train set, and I try and convince my wife that it's cheaper than a shrink. However, <laughs> she's, she's not quite on that page yet, but she accepts it. So <laughs> no, you make your own laugh. <laughs> it's, it's one way. It's one way of sitting. To be honest, you sit with a glass of red. And watch the train go around, and you just forget about the world for a little while. I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving this, and and, and having, um, you know, and all of a sudden, we, you know, you've got a reasonably sized business now. Running those people, you know, you, you're probably very used to having a lot of moving parts in, in your life. Yes. Um, and I, another quick question is that you started up in 2000 at Goldsboro. How has your approach to advice changed? Because in 2001, we obviously had. Uh, well, we had a we had a tech uh, boom, a bust. Sorry, and we've had we had terrorism, and then we had GFC. Um, what learnings have you had? I always like to ask this of people who've done a few of these. What's the learnings of how you've potentially pivoted or changed the way you deal with clients on the back of having quite a few negative correction? I've got to say that's not a question I've been asked before. Um, I think for me, it's about it's about just being I think being patient and taking time but also being a sounding board for people. So I, I guess if I look back when I first started, the the name of the game was see a client, get them on board, thanks very much, and away you go. Whereas I think these days it's very much much more of a process uh, that you would take in order to uh, you know meet client, spend time, get to know them a lot better, understand them in a lot more depth. And then by doing that, Become that sounding board and become that trusted advisor, but also become someone that, you know, if there's an issue going on, you can offer a whole lot of perspective. And that's where if we take COVID three or four years ago, by the middle of April 2020, we were spending lots of time 
just giving perspective because we knew markets had, had hardly expression crapped out but we also knew that it had gone too far. And so things were going to recover over time. And from that perspective, being in a position to be able to, um, I guess, have the time and the effort and the energy to be able to spend with clients is important. And when I'm, um, you mentioned that um, uh, that Goldsboro, you had three founders there. And I know a quick look down there, the names that you, you, you rattled off, I don't believe any of those founders are still with the businesses that are up. Correct. So when uh, when I joined Goldsboro in 2000, Peter, Glenn and John were all on board. Uh, and then in about 2005, 2006, Peter decided he wanted to retire out of the business. And that's when three of us became uh, small shareholders with John and Glenn as the majority shareholders at that time. Uh, and then over the journey, our shareholdings grew uh, and a couple of other shareholders came on board. Uh and Glenn, Glenn Todman for me was, as I said earlier, very much a mentor and a friend and someone that we all looked up to and worked with. And he drove Goldsboro extensively. Um, sadly, about nine years ago, we lost Glenn to cancer. And so that, uh, that shook the business for a significant period of time. But we had uh, John Oliver, who was, was a tower of strength, Susie Vincent, our CEO, was similarly a tower of strength and a core group of us that had been here at Goldsboro at that time for the best part of 15 years, all in a position where we could pick things up and move forward um, and, and, and continue to grow the business. And then John retired from the business about 15 months ago. So, okay. Um, so, yeah. okay. So that, that's, and, um, and now you've got it's it's almost two point zero. We spoke um, about the the long tenure of of many of your your business partners there. Yep. Um, and when I'm looking at the services and who we help um, on your website, you've 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 you you range from people living well in retirement to families getting ahead. But if I was to sort of ask you the the the, the avatar or the type of clients that you like to service there in 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 Adelaide, what, what would you what would be the answer? Look, I think traditionally. Like most financial planners, we've looked after mums and dads heading into retirement. They come to us and they've got this bucket of superannuation, which is the biggest amount of money they've probably ever seen in their lives. And they come in and they say, Breton, what do I do? How do you look after it? Keep me informed as to what's going on, but we want to enjoy life. And that's been brilliant from that perspective. And we we still, as a, as a group, love to work with the retiring mums and dads who are wanting advice and support. But similarly, we've pivoted a fair bit in the last two or three years to people like uh, those who are in small businesses. They're potentially quite time poor because they're spending so much time building their own business and not really sure what to do and how to set things up for their their future. They know that there's a number of aspects to um, what might entail wealth creation but they don't know how to set it up or how to put it together. So small business people is really important. And with that in mind, you, your practice is a pure play financial planning business. Do you get lots of your referrals from accounting partnerships? Because especially the, the latter cohort that you just mentioned. Yep. Um, no, not really, to be perfectly honest. We we do get some, some referrals from accounts. We get lots of referrals. In fact, I would suggest that as we've built the business and as we've intentionalized referrals, we would get 60 or 70% of our new clients, including the small business people, families, uh, our referrals from our existing clients. It's people that they know who are like-minded, wanting to work with a like-minded financial advisor. So with a lot of practices, as they've um, moved their way through uh, FOFA and, and they've rationalized, they've had to take on a lower number of clients and charge them charge them a more commercial rate. Given that you've got such a, a broad brush client base, um, how has how's Goldsboro gone about that transition in a, in a small town like um, or in a in a smaller capital city like Adelaide, where you you know you don't have that many significant significant options if you're uh, looking to try and get financial advice? So we worked. Uh, I'll go back a step. Um, predominantly through the early 2000s into the 2010s, like most financial planning groups, we would receive the commission that was going for whatever the product was. 
into the mid 2010s, so 20 sort of 15 ish, we looked then at a uh, percentage and a dollar base. So we, we did a bit of both. Over time, we, put, we started to, I guess, transition away from the percentage more to the flat dollar fee. And then in early 2000, at the time he was brilliant with COVID, uh, we got on board with Rob Jones and Peloton Partners. And we looked at the processes that they have and we adopted that for ourselves. And so all of a sudden, we went to pure fee for service for our clients based on a, a scale or a structure of what does it cost for our business to put the services together and then what are we charging clients? And just to reiterate, that was in uh, 2000 or Sorry, what was the- 2020. That's what I thought. I'm with that some other clients who, 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 who work with Peloton, and I'm like, okay, you might be yes. the first one. Oh, 20, but, um, 20, okay. 20, sorry. And I okay, say, so 20, you did. Uh, you did. You, you went through their program, identified uh, where you're undercharging, where you, you know, and, and just getting it right. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and I say 2020. Uh, I should have said 2020 because COVID hit, and so we we in late 2019 into early 2020, working with Rob and Elva as part of the process. And then by May of 2020, we thought, right, we're going to do this. And all of us as advisors would, and I can still remember sitting around boardroom table and we all went, this is not going to work. The world has fallen apart financially. We're going to talk to our clients about, in a number of instances, increasing fees, and it's just never going to work. We got about two months in and we all went, hang on, this is working because the clients actually understood and appreciated that the fees that we were going to charge or that we were charging, one, they could see with the transparency we had as to what the fees were going to be for, and two, they appreciated that it's a realistic fee for the services that we were offering them. Okay, and and look, uh, this having that, I mean, some firms got to it just through trial and error, and this, it was probably a little <laughs> bit of heartbreak, and, and um, look, this is also kind of, uh, you know, when I turn my attention to the engine room that is your business, because getting clients happy with being fully disclosed of what they're doing and, and everyone having a real combo arm home, it's great, but you've got to make some profit. And yes. that's and that's not just and that needs to not just be cascading through the, the, the shareholders and the advisors, but also the entire team. So if I'm if I'm looking at your your business, um can maybe if I get a bit of an idea of the corporate structure, you've got a CEO, your practice manager, get us a bit of a feel of of how you're structured, and then we'll talk about maybe uh, how it operates with the different client cohorts, please. No, not a problem. So uh, Susie Vincent is our CEO, and Susie's been with Goldsborough for uh, 25 to 28 years off the top of my head. Uh, Rebecca Young is our practice manager and been with us for about five years. Um, so Susie's role, overseer of all things Goldsboro. Rebecca handles a lot more of the the day to day management and human resources, if you like. We have five uh, advisors who are shareholder advisors, and we have another four salaried advisors that work for Goldsbrook. So we've got nine of us as advisors, plus uh, a, a risk insurance expert uh, who's also an AR, uh, and then we've got uh, about a dozen support staff. So yeah, we're we're a reasonably lean ship in many respects. But we're a group that has lots of longevity when it comes to tenure of time at Goldsboro. Oh, we spoke about this. You, you either you love the place, or someone's got some photos of the 2005 Christmas party that uh, is uh, <laughs> no. locked up in under wraps, right? So, I, think, so. <laughs> I think it's definitely that people love the place, and and that's awesome. that's something we we generally only see staff leave on, on retirement. To be perfectly honest, it's it's pretty unusual for us to lose a staff member, uh, certainly to another another financial planning practice or or something like that. So for us, it's it's a lot about the culture and and having a workplace where everybody feels part of the team, everybody feels comfortable to turn up of a morning and do their job, but know that they feel uh, welcome and part of that. Well, another another part of it is that practically. Um, You've gone through a uh, a succession plan, you know, and, and as yes. you mentioned, you mentioned that the three quality people who put the business together that that for for, that for various reasons of of either passed or 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 have retired, but you've been replaced with six 
Six of you are shareholders, and I believe uh, five advisors plus the CEO are Terrific. shareholders. Can I ask, um, were you all uh, employees working within the group and then decided to do like an ESOP, or did anyone come in with the client base and sort of bolt on? What was How has that come about? Because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a relatively healthy number of of, of, of people as, a, as a equity holders in the business. Yep. So um, it sort of, it's all, it's all happened organically, to be perfectly honest, Andrew. Um, where uh, three of us started as as small shareholdings, and like most like most businesses, to be honest, the bank owned a fair chunk of it for a period of time. It's called and timeshare, <laughs> really, <laughs> correct. And so from there, it's then been a situation where we've been in a position, uh, for example, with Glenn's death, where we've then you know looked at how do we acquire or how do we deal with his shareholding, and then similarly with John when John retired. Um, where we've then, as a group, bought uh, more shares and we've brought on, so I said the three shareholders initially, we've brought on three other advisor shareholders over the journey as well. So um, it's a group that worked very cohesively together. Uh, we have a board of three of us um, with others having you know opportunity to certainly offer input. Um, but, yeah, with six shareholders, we're pretty comfortable with how it's structured. So if I'm working there as a as a salaried uh, advisor or someone else, at least I see there's a there's a pattern or a history of being given that that particular opportunity. It might be for me this year, but yes. there is fall for it oh, happening. Absolutely. You know? So yes. that, that's probably you know probably quite a, yeah, it's probably quite a good thing. Um, you mentioned you had a bit of uh, debt. Was that was that was obviously um, or not obviously that could be in part buying out shelters. Was there also any M and A that you've done over the years acquiring anything? No, we haven't. As a as a business, we haven't had M and A. Um, we've simply grown organically, but certainly uh, M and A is something that's at the top of the tree for us at the moment here at Goldsboro. It's you know something where uh, we're looking at you know keeping everyone busy, bringing on quality staff, bringing on quality clients who will fit well with with what we do and how we do it. Well, let's talk about. Um, what you're all about to find out if anyone out there listening That's is right. interested, right? That's right. So, so um, uh, so you've got Rebecca running the operations of the business or the business of the business. Maybe give us a bit of a feel. Um, uh, how many? How many? So you've got uh, nine ARs um, plus a risk insurance specialist, which is which is great. Um, how many uh, family units do you do, do you guys operate in terms of? Like how many retained families or, or clients are you doing on the full service? Oh, on the full service, we're yeah. looking after, off the top of my head, about a thousand. Okay, so so, so you, 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 you're you're thereabouts that sort of eighty to one hundred families yep. each. Yep, yes. and, and some are complex and some are less. But yep. um, and you know that's kind of where a lot of practices are at. But you're insinuating that you've got there's some capacity within uh, each one of your advisors. Um, collectively to to absorb a few more. Yeah, look, most definitely we're in a position where we we think probably the one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy five per advisor is the sort of figure that we would we would ultimately want to look at. Um, and that's that's partly where um, we're in a position from a you know if I look at investing side of things, we do a lot of work now with uh, managed accounts, and so the managed account side of it enables us to be. A little more, I guess, relaxed for want of an expression, um, but have that ability to perhaps be able to service a few more clients. But it all comes back to time management for each advisor. That's the other important aspect. Well, to it. You might be re- relaxed, Brenton, but you've got a thousand clients, mate. That's that's eighty full reviews that your operations team has got to deliver to yep. the advisors, and then the advisors deliver to their clients every single month. Yep. Okay, including Christmas. So, yep. so. How and I'll come back to your your investments in a second because streamlining that is is it makes a, a big difference to the engine room regardless of the investment outcome for the client. Yeah. Um, how are you arranged? Are you in? Uh, you know, you've got you've got 12, 12 um people in administration. Mm-hmm. Are you in pods that where you're looking at where someone's looking after one or two advisors, or is it centralised? Just give us a feel of what it's like to work. No, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So. Our structure here is we've got uh, two pla- para planners, and both our para planners have been with us for uh, twenty years plus. So again, that that longevity, that that tenure is is important for us. We then work with uh, a client services manager looking after two or three advisors, 
Uh, we've then got uh, our receptionist, Caroline, who does an amazing job uh, of welcoming people. Uh, and we've got a couple of other support staff that, that sort of fill in the gaps where is necessary um, from that perspective. And uh, going back to uh, you've got one person specialising in risk, does that mean that everyone internally, when, when a risk opportunity comes across, refers internal? Generally, yeah. Yeah, and we don't, to be honest, we don't do a lot of risk. Um, it's not certainly not core to what we do here at Goldsboro, um, but you know there are there are always opportunities that arise, and so having someone who specialises in risk. Uh, similarly, one of our advisors, Matthew Kelly, he's our aged care aged care specialist, and so you know knowing that you've got a couple of experts where you know sometimes as an advisor, and the way I describe it is you know enough to be dangerous, and so. When it comes to aged care, saying to a client, look, go and talk to Matt because he's got it all. He knows exactly what's going on. Or Valeska, who's our risk insurance specialist, let's introduce you to Valeska and let's make sure well, that we can make that work. And there'll be times when on the insurance side, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go any further. But the introduction is made and there's an opportunity for someone to talk to a specialist in that field. So but you've got that all going on in- internally. So quite a lot of other businesses... Um- uh, uh, have external consultants doing their aged care and their, and their life insurance. Yep. And uh, uh, the, the less is probably going, stop, you know, what are you saying? We're not doing much life insurance. I, I want to do as much as I can. So so you might be getting um, you might be getting cupcakes for the board. Correct. Uh, Correct. Uh, Brenton. So uh, uh, we, we can edit that out, but where's the fun in that? So uh, we probably leave that one she in. Won't, she, won't, she won't mind, I'm sure. <laughs> so, and then uh, what's the, what's, so uh, you, you, you're self-licensed. When did you get your license? So we've been self-licensed for, I reckon, nearly 30 years. Uh, I actually can't give you an exact date because I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's certainly the 24 years I've been at, here at Goldsboro, we've been self-licensed for all of that period of time, and I know prior to that for sure. Uh, is, is, are your clients all retail, wholesale, or a combination? No, look, 100% retail. And so um, that that's partly, I guess, uh, the dynamic you have with an Adelaide population. We don't see a lot of people here in Adelaide uh, who would necessarily feel, fit into the wholesale client space. But as a business and as, I guess, as a practice, I would rather see us provide a statement of advice and, and follow all of the processes and protocols, whether they're wholesale or retail, to be perfectly honest. Sounds like you might be the responsible manager, Brenton. Is that correct? I'm, one, I'm actually one of yes. Yeah, well, that, well, I was one for many years, but that, 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 that comment. Right? Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, it's like no. We, what I'd like to do is just make sure that uh, we're completely elderly covered because I'm on the line, which is fair, right? And 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 you're yep. right there. Now, um, uh, given that you're self licensed, um, what's what's your tech stack? How do you uh, how do you like? You have a thousand clients. You're obviously aspirational for new ones. Yep. Um, you're up there cracking the whip, saying, "Let's go from 100 to 150 each." What's the yep. tech stack that you believe that you've got currently that will help you deliver that organic growth? Oh, uh, look for us. We've we've used X Plan for a long number of years and very comfortable uh, in the main with it. Is it is it perfect? I'm not convinced, but I'm not sure that there's a a, a program or a platform out there that would necessarily be perfect. I know that Susie in particular has spent a lot of time working with uh, the x team to adopt, adapt, make suggestions, make it work. Um, we have you know, the, the tasks and threads behind the scene that um, we as advisors are never, ever allowed to look at or understand necessarily, but we know they're all there. They work, and that's part of what makes the whole process for us uh, here at Goldsboro work really smooth. And given the length and breadth of your offering, everything from young families to self-employed uh, business owners to aged care um, requirements, yep. um, do you have a, a client-facing um, piece of software to deliver reviews, or, or what's what's the what's the way in which so, you do that? Yeah, no, I understand the question. We've we've got a portal that we've been using as part of X Plan for a while. Is it perfect? Again, not convinced, but it it does the job. Uh, we're in the throes at the moment of building an app. So it's that clients, and like everyone, got something on their phone, they're going to be able to use it. So for us, getting an app to work and make sure it works right from day one, that's really important. So we've spent some time doing that. We're probably latecomers, as it were, to something like that. But 
for us, it's a, it's again about the personal rather than necessarily the technology. The technology for me as an advisor is there to be able to support whenever I'm sitting with a client. And um, so Peloton came in in 2020 and, and, and spoke to you about um, uh, segmentation and, and client fees amongst many other things. When did you make the decision to uh, run with a, an SMA or an IMA? I reckon probably 12 or 18 months later. Um, so mid-21 mid, mid 21 into 2022, we looked at and started to work with uh, Zenith with initially with their MA. Um, we do uh, a lot of our work and a lot of our platform stuff is through First Choice. And so using using that platform and, and with the MA, uh, we're very comfortable that you know, over a period of time and, and again, for us it's about implementing something but doing it with baby steps to make sure that it works rather than jump in boots and all and if it falls apart, we look like goofers. Um, how long did the – so at what percentage of your 1,000-odd um, clients have moved to this structure? Uh, I would say about 50% at the moment okay. would be okay. a reasonable amount. Yeah, I think I think 50% is probably a, a, a realistic figure. Um, we know, you know, for some of our clients who are perhaps the, at the smaller end, it's not necessarily for them, but by the same token, it gives us that ability and that, I guess, that wherewithal to be able to have it there for whoever we want. And you mentioned that you get a lot of clients from, or just organically from existing clients. Do you run, um, what, what do you run as far as marketing to, to stimulate that, those, or is it sort of dependent on the relation, the long term relationship of the advisors? Bit of both. So we uh, we historically uh, have run a lot of seminars, the retirement seminars through you know through the two thousands into the the twenty tens. Um, haven't really done a lot of seminars in the last. I mean, COVID shut everything down anyway. Um, but the other, I guess, the two other big things that Golds for us done over my journey is a lot of talkback radio. So I, we, I, I was, I've been waiting for you to, I've been waiting for you to bring that up. It's it, it been since two thousand, apparently, on your website. Correct. Correct. So I, I joined Goals for in two thousand, and in fact, Talkback Radio has probably been going for three or four years prior to that. Um, Glenn had a very good relationship with a bloke called Bob Francis, and Bob was one of the the announcers at Radio Station Five AA here in Adelaide, and so we would do Talkback uh, for a half hour or an hour uh, on a Wednesday night. The Money um, Talks Talkback Show. Absolutely. So um, I'd, I'd only been here at Goldsboro for about six or eight weeks and Glenn said, come on, you're coming in to do radio with me. And I went in and had a bit of a conversation and Bob said, well, the kids are natural and I've been doing Talkback Radio ever since. So for us, Talkback Radio has been a, an amazing way to sell Goldsboro and what we do, but a great way to give back because you're, you're there providing all of this information I think the one thing that Talkback Radio teaches you is that you've got to think fast on your feet because you don't know what questions are being asked by the, the callers calling in, um, and so you uh, you've really got to you've got to make it work. And look, if you had your time again, when I asked you where your clients come from, and you said, "Oh, they come from client referrals," you've actually downplayed um, that role of of building Goldsboro as a trusted confidant. Um, you know, on 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 the radio for for, for two decades, and so I don't think you can uh, you, you can um, overestimate just how much of an impact that's probably had, not just yeah. on uh, new clients, but also you know potentially new team members, and 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 just as well. And and you also um, you write a column as well, is that right? Correct. So I've I've uh, I took over from Glenn uh, shortly before his death uh, as the money man for the Sunday Mail. Uh, here in Adelaide, and then I've learned over the last two or three years that that's now syndicated uh, in quite a number of papers around Australia. So, uh, Kieran, the- we're, we're, we're going to try and find some links for that one. Okay, so we'll we'll, we'll try and pump up your. Uh, so yeah. I don't I don't think any financial planners will be there, but it's always good to get a bit of a link. And and yeah. you know, sometimes I talk to, to to practices, and they're kind of like, where do you get your next client from? And it, it takes it takes persistence, consistency. Um, um, and, and a little bit of thinking outside the square, which is exactly what this is. And and the referral side of it is something where we, I reckon I would go back probably 15 years ago, where we actually had a program, uh, someone came in, spent some time telling us, how do you get referrals? Best way to get a referral, ask your client. 
And it, to be honest, it took us a long time to get our heads around that. But when you start asking clients for referrals, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's like shaking an olive tree when the olives are uh, ready to go. They just fall to the ground and the referrals just happen. So we're, we're very grateful for the referrals that our clients provide. But yes, you're right. The, I guess the, uh, what we do on, uh, on radio and what we have done on radio has provided us with lots and lots of um, kudos. Awesome. And um, you've got, you mentioned um, you've got uh, a board. Um, the owners are all employee shareholders. Um, do you have like targets around what you'd like as percentage of, of profit or, or what, what sort of, you know, if, if I'm in the tent, so to speak, what's what's the rhetoric around the business of the business? I guess the, the business of the business for us is a, about, um, to be honest, it's about making sure that we've got happy clients who are continuing to refer, but it's about then making sure that there is a, a good profit margin in there so as that you know, as a business, we know that what we're doing and how we're doing it is working well. Um, is there a figure we put on it? I'm going to suggest around the 25% mark from a profit yeah. perspective. And, and was that was that sort of what, when Peloton came in, sorry to, to, to no, cut you're you there, um, when Peloton came in, was that, was that part of the, I suppose, strategy that you guys were sort of trying to figure out how to have a more certainty around that? Because, you know, simultaneously with more shareholders and more aspirational shareholders, people putting their house up for security and whatnot, they probably need that that that, that certainty. What, what, what drove you to, to engage Peloton? Uh, you, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It was we, we were a business that we're just trundling along and we're charging a particular way, but we knew that, there were ways to do it better and ultimately to help clients understand what we actually are charging is a realistic fee. And then the, I guess the one thing that Rob emphasised through the whole process was you are in this business to make a profit and so therefore the clients need to understand that you're in this business to make a profit and that profit needs to be built into any and everything that you're charging as part of the process. Uh, absolutely, and and look, um, uh, that then, uh, you know, that that culture of accountability cascades through. And now, when we're talking about people, what I'd like to to um, you know, ch- change gears with is, um, you've mentioned about your people and your culture, but I wouldn't mind just sort of digging down as to 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 really what that is, because um, uh, you know, what I like to ask is why people join, why they stay, and how do they grow. We have focused on why they stay, but. Maybe, you know, why someone would join your business now, um, yep. uh, either in, in the, the support or, or the advice team. And then, you know, how are you going to take those, I'm not saying younger people, but younger in the industry through to being ultimately, you know, happy shareholders as it sounds like you are? Look, I, th- I think for us, people join Goldsboro because they see an organisation that is successful, that is very, very well known in Adelaide and and broader in South Australia, and they want to be part of that success. Um, And so for us, it's it's a culture piece, but importantly, it's, I guess, beyond that culture in terms of how successful we actually have been as a a business over the journey. Um, So that's probably the the most important part of why would would people want to join. Um, I guess the best example I can give for uh, a young advisor joining Goldsboro. We uh, we took on Mimir about 18, 20 months ago uh, as a professional year advisor. Yep. And so we'd not done a PY. And so uh, Mimir was in an existing financial planning practice um, and saw an opportunity to join Goldsboro uh, to do his PY. And for us, it was you know almost a vertical learning curve when it comes to the PY stuff, but it also offered us the opportunity to have someone come in who was keen to get involved, who wants to learn, wants to be part of the process, but wants to be around for the long term. And that was that was the really important part for us. And with the, the business, um, you're in one location, and is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're, yeah. we're at one location here in Parkside. We've, um, we've always had only one location. Um, so for the first 22 years or 21 years, I was at Goldsboro. We are actually about 500 metres uh, west of where I'm sitting at the moment. 
Um, and so we we had to move buildings about three years ago. Um, so yeah, all in one location. And that's something that we uh, have talked about is do we end up with satellite offices or otherwise? And at the moment, the decision is, no, we're going to stay uh, centralised and in one location. And we're in a building big enough that as we expand and as we grow, we've actually got the ability within the single building to be able to do that. Do all your team come to work every day or you've still got a, a level of hybrid work? A little bit of hybrid. Um, what does that, that mean? So that's a little bit of hybrid. Um, our power planners in particular both work from home a couple of days a week, uh, right. which is fine, which which is great because we've got teams um, that we well, use. Well, after 20 years, you can probably trust them, right? Uh, yeah, that's a fair comment. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, and the work gets done. You know, there's yep. And very, power planning is very measurable. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's very measurable. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. No, I, I mean, that, that's got, probably easy. Yep. Yeah. But we've, we've got a couple of our other support staff still work from home. Uh, a, a one day a week as a rule. Um, look, from from a, a management perspective, if you're wanting to work at home, that's great. If the productivity is starting to fall, there's a problem. How do you know? Um, I think you know because, of, for me, what's crossing my desk in terms of information from clients, appointment stuff, et cetera. So you, you do know that there's, you know, the productivity is there. Well, especially when you've got um, you know a thousand odd clients to review before you kick off um, any growth in a year, yep. um, your operations team, your power planners, they're going to, have to be joined at the hip and and you know run run by by Rebecca effectively as the, the practice manager. Yep. What's that? What's the meeting rhythms of the business? You know, do when do the operations team get together? When do, you know what what's when do you guys get together? Do you do monthlies, quarterlies? Do you do weeklies, dailies? What's it like to be in Goldsboro? From so, a cadence yep. perspective. Yep. So in that regard, uh, we meet every Wednesday morning as a practice. So yep. all of us all of us meet in the same room uh, for a, whether it be a 15-minute or a 45-minute conversation. Uh, we've got an agenda that we go through and really try and understand uh, what's making us tick on a particular week. Um, Rebecca and the administration team meet fortnightly, and so they, they're catching up what's changing, what's new, what are we doing well? What do we need to change uh, in terms of processes and the like? As shareholders, we're meeting on a monthly basis. Uh, as directors, we're meeting on a quarterly basis. As a management team, uh, we meet. So there's four of us in the management team, sort of senior management, if you like. We also meet on a weekly basis. So, and, there and is, this, is, it, is there any sort of philosophy or coaching philosophy that that you 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 tether this all to? Um, I'm going to say not necessarily, to be honest, Andrew. Um, it's stuff that's probably a lot of it's been done since day one, um, but it's also you know a good way of just spending time. If I take management, just spending time for half an hour, understanding big picture stuff, how things are going with the business. So it's it's partly about culture. Uh, some of the administration side of it is certainly about processes and, and I guess, people management. Um, but, yeah, as I say, from a management, you know, from our management point of view, it's about understanding big picture, how things are going and what's going on on a very regular basis. And do you have, so with, with your advisors, um, notwithstanding some and shareholders, but if we take that off, everyone's got to be, you know, what you do day to day needs to be measurable. Do you have a, a new business uh, target for each advisor? Not as such. No, it's something that we've we've never really had targets per se. We've had what we would call aspirational goals, uh, where we look at you know what's our what's our profit target or what's our what's our recurring revenue target and how we're going to achieve that. And therefore, we then look at you know what sort of volume of uh, advice documents do we need to do and the like. I get that, which which makes sense. But as as a new person comes through, and you mentioned you've you've got a PY person yep. who's who's, who's uh, started with the business recently, um, yep. will be the expectation that that you go you you I suppose graduate clients across to that person, and if so, then then you're going to have to bring some new ones in. You know that that's the that's the hard part of of of, of scaling. Is that so? So in saying that, is that kind of the plan for your PY program? Our, our PY will get a number of clients from each of the the five shareholder advisors because we're the the five of us. We're I guess we've got the fullest books in inverted commas. 
Yep. And so from that perspective, it's a situation where uh, we've spent time in Momia's first year with us. Uh, he sat in on a significant number of appointments, uh, initially just observing, then a little bit of involvement, and then a lot more involvement, and then running some of the meetings. And I found personally that that I was able to identify clients who engaged well with him that would make, you know, would provide a good opportunity uh, for me to go, okay, I'd like my Mia to look after you going forward in the knowledge that I'm still there in the background. It's not like I'm getting rid of you as a client, but I've got other stuff that I need to do, including, you know, my director's role here at Goldsboro, as well as taking on new clients and new businesses. And I've just glazed across um, your uh, seminars. You mentioned you do seminars, and I know, uh, and then we sort of got distracted with uh, yep. the radio stuff. But you do seminars every two weeks. We haven't done the we haven't done two weekly seminars for a long time. Oh, I'm, sorry, this one, I'm just reading yeah. off your website. The last couple yep. in in November. Yep. And so we've got yeah. We've got, we, we, so what we do is we do seminars quarterly, but right. when we do them, we do them two weeks apart. So we do an aged care seminar and a retiring seminar. Gotcha, so, gotcha. That makes sense now. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was going to say, that... historically, sorry, historically we did our seminars monthly and we always used to do them uh, one mid-afternoon and one at early evening. Um, and numbers-wise, things were going okay for a, a long period. So lots and lots of people coming along. Then things just started to to get a little bit slower. And I, th- I don't think there'd be a financial advisor through the the mid teens of the two thousands, that would say every seminar was flat out like they were ten years previous. Well, I think there was also a rise and rise of people being able to obtain information even more easily. You know, whether it's uh, uh, the internet or, 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 or YouTube or, or whatnot. So, so there's a uh, you know, a lot of it's not correct, and, and, yes. and as we know, a lot of it's unlicensed. And 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 um, but but there was sort of um, almost an over information. Yes, um, that happened as well during that time. So, um, given that your team come into the office, and given that they've all been there for a long time, and you're, you you are self licensed, so you're kind of running your own your own race as far as looking at sort of how other people do things. How do you celebrate? So, do you do like annual conferences, or, or what, what's what's fun look like? Fun for us, we we always have a, a mid year. Uh, cl- uh, staff and partners event uh, where we go out, have a meal, um, generally involves a bevy or two, to be perfectly honest. Um, and then at Christmas time, we, uh, we'll we have a, a our Christmas show, generally the Friday before Christmas. Well, well, well what's a Christmas show? I, I want yeah. to know everything about that. So is it, is it we, we, so no finals. There's okay. no <laughs> photos, as you insinuated earlier. Christmas right. show things, shut, shut the office at lunchtime on the Friday, uh, go somewhere really nice for a meal, uh, and that generally goes on for many, many an hour. That's for sure. So, um, and then our our admin staff have an opportunity if they want to, from a professional development point of view, uh, go on a conference or uh, pick up some study to do something to develop themselves. So, what would be an example of that? Because that's pretty. Like, I didn't, I didn't tease that question out of you. You've, you've said that, and you know, yep. one of my other. Questions will be, you know, uh, would you ever contemplate someone who's not an advisor being a shelter? But, you, but, but you've already you've got a yeah. CEO as a shelter. So, so yep. what would be an example of a course that uh, an admin or operations person would come to you and you go, "That's actually something we can we can get by." It. Yep. I look for us. I mean, we've had I think we've had a couple of people do some of the Microsoft stuff, so just to understand some of the technology a whole lot better. Oh, you're um, always going to do that. I literally was talking to one of my other business partners about having to. Just get a lot more knowledge on Copilot yes. today. So yeah, Definitely. great. And, then, and our and Rebecca is our practice manager. She she's always looking for not necessarily better ways, but updated ways to deal with things from a HR perspective. And so you know, there's generally things around um, whether we we as a group uh, of advisors uh, we're we're very uh, involved with IWF alliances. And so okay. we a yep. few go to their annual conference, and that's. So the- you're not isolated. I, you, oh no! I, I, I sort of was. I was sort of wondering. Okay, so IWF Alliance is okay. Great, great program, right? There's good yes. businesses there as well. Yep, okay, that definitely. makes that makes sense, right? So yeah. that also gives you exposure to 
you know, looking over the fence at what other mid-tier kind of yep. practices do, not only yep. in your town but across Australia, correct? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And, they, and, and to be honest, of all of the conferences that I've been to over the journey, um, Andy and his team with IWF Alliance has put together a really, really good program that is always compact but full of information. You, you, you go away recharged and refreshed, no question of that at all. Oh, there you go. Shout out. We'll chuck the Alliance link. Uh, Karen, Thanks, I'll, uh, in, in uh, say Peloton, the Alliance link. Got a few oh. other ones there. Um, so uh, in relation to your goals for being basically uh, a, a stalwart of, of, of South Australia for, for a long, long time, um, I asked you beforehand, what would you like to see happen in goals? Because you've been going for a while, but... You know, you just mentioned that you'd love to have more people seeing more clients in your business. You've never done M&A, but you're thinking about it. What would be the type of person or business that you think you'd be best suited with? And without, you know, making any sort of guarantees or commitment, um, would it be something that you'd look to do in the next year or so? I'll answer your second question first because the answer to that is absolutely. We we would be really keen to talk with uh, probably a smaller practice, uh, someone who has perhaps been an advisor for a while is deciding whether they do or don't want to continue in that role. We would be more than comfortable uh, taking that advisor on board with a transition period. That, that would absolutely be part of the process because we're wanting to make sure that the process of the handover of clients is as smooth as possible. Perhaps the example I'll use is after Glenn's death, Susie is our CEO. She actually went through and spoke with every single one of Glenn's clients and identified which of the five advisors at that time would be the best person for them to work with. Um, and that took a hell of a long time, but it was a process really worthwhile because Susie knew her advisors and she knew a lot of Glenn's clients because prior to being CEO, she'd been his para planner and, and a support staff for him. And so she knew his clients quite well. In fact, a lot of them she knew exceptionally well. And so the ability to be able to match clients with advisors is really, really important as part of that process. And the type of – so given that you're self-licensed, mm -hmm. if I was an advisor – so. You know, we do get this 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 kind of. I ask people what their vision is for the future, and 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 there's no right answer because there's people I speak to that are specialist in one particular discipline, and they want to double down on that or become hyper specialist. There's people that say we want to be really really good at operations, and and as advisors plug into our business, they'll go from you know not much EBIT to a lot of EBIT, and we'll share in that up, uh, upside. What what what's some um, uh, you know if you could wave a, a magic wand, what would be the I suppose two or three attributes other than someone wanting to to exit because there's plenty of advisors out there that are young who don't want to exit but also don't want to yep. run the minutiae of a business. Yep. Um, and, and in fact, uh, especially as the the banks have exited financial advice, I talk to lots of really high quality, high technical advisors. You've come out of that. Love talking to clients. Have been doing it for twenty years, but geez, they never signed up to run a business. Yeah, so no, would, I understand would, for sure. Yeah, would that extend to someone who wants to have a sort of a longer career? Uh, it can. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a situation where, for us, it's it's a lot about culture, and so you know, and I keep I keep saying that, but it's something that has worked for Goldsborough for a long period of time, and so you know, knowing knowing people and understanding them and understanding their businesses is really important part of that whole transition process for us. So it's taking the time and doing uh, the right due diligence from a business perspective, but doing the right due diligence from a people perspective as well is really important. Well, that's probably the first thing that you do, but sometimes people get caught up with with the excitement of doing a deal Correct. sometimes. So, so that, that can... That can cloud. Uh, you went, and I, I, I heard a, a couple of smart, smart operators um, uh, on another um, uh, conference recently say that the um, if two businesses join together, the uh, the EBIT of the mothership will be where they end up. 
Yep. So if you're, <laughs> so if, you, if, 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 if you're thinking it'll change, because if you don't get that bit right, it, everything just gravitates to that, you know. So whether or not that's operational or client segmentation or, or, or whatnot, um, it, it works very well. So uh, now I've asked you a vision for your future, but you've been kicking around in financial planning for goodness gracious almost as long as myself, right? You've got kids, although you've basically that none of them are headed back into the business. Um, what's your, I suppose, vision for, for the future of, of people entering the industry and what do you think is going to be the best, most sustainable way for them to make their way into practices such as yourself? Um, I, I guess I see the, the future of financial planning uh, as very, I've got to say, very positive. And I, I say that because it's given me opportunities that I guess I look back and go, I would never have had those if I hadn't gone down the path that I've gone. And for me, it's about working with people, understanding them, getting to know them, uh, and then having that long-term relationship with them. So someone new wanting to come into financial planning, whether it be in an administration role, whether it be in a financial planning role, it's, I guess my shout out or my, my comment would be, be prepared to get to know people. And so that's that's probably the most important part of it all. The technical stuff, that all happens. We know that's there. You've got to learn it. You've got to understand it. But you've also got support around you. And that's the beauty of a practice like Goldsboro. We've got nine of us as ARs that if I'm not sure of something, I'll go and bounce it off someone else. And you've probably got, what, Microsoft Teams or, or one of those sorts of chat forums. Yeah, absolutely. Is that right? All the time. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're not working. I mean, I'm not sitting in my office isolated from the whole team. I'm working with a team where we're able to liaise and, and work together. Someone goes on holidays. Someone else picks up the clients for a few weeks. And so that's, you know, that's what we can also tell our clients is we don't work in isolation. We work as a collective. And that's really important from a culture perspective again. And look, when we, uh, you know, I, I interview lots of different practices, but I don't know everybody. And and it was only recently that um, uh, some of our team were, were, were chatting actually to, to Rob, Rob Jones and his team at Peloton. And uh, um, uh, we always sort of, we're all about the positive evolution of financial advice. And, and rather than um, chat to them, which we have before on other channels, we we asked for some of their success stories, and I don't know whether you realise that, but they they said go and chase up uh, Goldsboro. So, uh, so well, I'm hoping that they're correct. By the sounds of it, you had a um, a, a pretty big program. You've, you've you've engaged them. You've rolled it out to your clients, as you've intimated. The clients have a better understanding of what you do and the value. Yeah, Probably the we, inputs we put through. We would have put through over 1,200 clients through the Peloton process, as we called it, and wow. we. Have- we had a 97 or 8% success rate. So for me, that comes back to the advisor delivering what we're talking about from the fee side of it, uh, as well as the clients being really engaged as part of the process. And what was the tangible uplift commercially to the uplift? company? Uh, yeah. Probably about 35% in terms of fees uplift. Wow. And yep. if you had almost everyone who you wanted to yep. come on board. Yep. It's Correct. interesting, there isn't it? Some, you know? yeah. there, were, there were some that, you know, you, you look at your smaller clients and you go, can't justify the fee for the funds under advice. And look, you don't like to do it, but all advisors, and I, I'm going to say all advisors, everybody quickly goes, okay, here's the dollar fee. I'm going to convert it back to a percentage of funds under advice because that's just the way – We've been programmed to think for a long period of time. For a client, we go, heck, that fee's going to be two, two and a half percent of your funds under advice. I'm not going to be able to justify that. So there were some clients where we deliberately didn't put them through the, the Peloton process because we knew that it, you couldn't, in good conscience and from an ethics point of view, charge them that really high fee. You look, and one of the one of the very interesting. Uh, Subtopics of of the the, the FOFA rollout, which uh, you know the the general rhetoric was to crack down on on uh, you know greedy financial planners who were exploiting clients was was basically um, to get paid fairly 
and um, that getting paid fairly and demonstrating value, um, the, the, I suppose the negative byproduct the government has ended up with is about one, only about a fifth of the clients that were being advised are, are being advised, and there's no real um, uh, there's no real way forward. But it's also made the, the financial planning businesses more valuable. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, it's 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 you know focusing on 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 profitability rather than recurring income and detaching ourselves from from the the product manufacturers and probably that- wouldn't probably wouldn't have happened uh, any time soon. But the, when when they enforce it on us, we've gone wow! You can actually make a fair bit of money and have a fairly good career. And being a shareholder actually is very similar to being a shareholder of other businesses that have profit and dividends and all these sorts of things. So. Yeah, I, I think it's um it, it, the great wake up call happened um happened pretty quickly. Well, they probably didn't feel like that in the trenches. Uh, it, look in the trenches, as I said earlier, you know we all we all went nah, You know the the uplift is is too much. Clients won't accept it. COVID had come along, etc. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're all making it work. And and part of the process for us was also <laughs> probably the best time you've been wrong ever. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, um, but. One of the one of the other things we always did when we were going through Peloton was we would catch up once a week, separate from all of our other meetings, and we would talk through our successful success stories. What did we do well? Why did you do it? How did you talk about that? Someone says, "Oh, I didn't didn't get this client over the line." Okay, what script did you or didn't you use? How can we help you to make that a better process? So, as a collective and as a group, it provided us with this amazing opportunity. I guess to be able to work just even a little bit closer together for a common good, which was build up the business from a revenue perspective, and also um, you having a sounding board there. Uh, you know, I intimated that, that that running your own business can be lonely. Um, you've got uh, a collegiate environment in the um, yeah. Idaho Alliances, and and just speaking to someone, uh, you know, any coach or, or, or you know, especially the people at Peloton, they just said. Yeah, we've got other practices. <laughs> you know, you always go through the five stages of grief until you get to acceptance. Actually, the clients aren't paying. Well, they do see value because we are actually transparent. So, yeah. no, what a great journey. So, look, I, I, um, uh, I'd like to thank you um, for your time today, uh, Brenton. Um, I know that uh, I'm taking time very quickly out of you having to go pick up kids from somewhere to deliver from somewhere else. <laughs> um the, uh, the the safe space uh, in your home, which is the, the the train thing. We don't have links to the live train feed, do we, Karen? That was something that uh, you insinuated no, we should get. No, I can't do that. I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> no, that's, that's it. That's it. That's behind a paywall, mate, in case you're wondering. Only trains is the paywall. <laughs> so uh, we're not editing that out either, Brenton. No. So um, <laughs> um, I, I'd like to thank you on behalf of, of the, the Ensemble Engine Room. Um, I'd also, uh, I suppose, like to highlight uh, the journey that you've you've you've, you've taken with Peloton, and they'll, they'll they'll gracious enough to refer you know a few of their success stories. But you know, a thirty five percent uptake and a ninety seven percent acceptance of people you want it is is a bloody great success story. So, not just to you, but all of the people that were involved in your business, congratulations, and um, thank you very much for joining me today on the Intro. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. <laughs>